Okay, so one of the great things about running a YouTube channel is that it sometimes gets you into places you wouldn't normally get into. And I'm very lucky. I've been invited down here to the Marconi Centre in Cornwall, and I'm joined here by Terry, who's a wealth of knowledge about this place. So uh, let's well, just have a little you. bit of a chat about the history, because this place is uh, famous for um, Marconi's uh, attempts with radio across the Atlantic. Yeah, so. it's, it's, it's quite unique, and it's sort of something of the, the holy grail for radio amateurs. Um, the building is actually built about 20 years ago to commemorate the test that Marconi did in 1901 where he managed to send a signal across the pond, across to, to Canada. And um, we, it was built as a memorial to, to Marconi and we, we operate it as a public museum. It's open to the general public uh, on Sundays and, and Wednesdays and it's manned by members of the Polview Amateur Radio Club, the PARC. Uh, we've got quite a lot of fairly interesting items here. Some of them have been um, in, uh, uh, were actually from Marconi's day, and some of them are actually replicas which we built to, to demonstrate things. So the, the, the aim is to try and uh, get as many people in the uh, world interested in, in radio. Um, we have lots, we have about 10% of our visitors are radio amateurs, so they're obviously preachers are converted there, but we have lots of other people that do take an interest. And as the Park Club, we try and run uh, um, foundation courses and so on to, to get them to move into amateur radio. So Marconi, um, everybody knows Marconi. In the late, latter part of the um, 19th century, he came over to the UK to try and uh, interest uh, the UK government and other people in his, his radio systems. He obviously came from Italy, and there wasn't a, um, a lot of interest there for, for various reasons. And uh, he managed to get quite a lot of backing from the Jameson Whiskey Company, which was his mother's uh, family company, and he, he started, started up his business where he was sent be able to communicate with um, ships um, off, off the coast. But this wasn't really making him a lot of money, so he wanted to go for a slightly bigger prize, uh, which he saw as being the uh, transatlantic telegram market. Very big in those days. Um, local uh, company here, the Eastern Telegram Company, was uh, dominating that in those days, and sending a lot of telegram time to newspapers like the, the London Times and the New York Times where they were sending international stories. Mark only saw this as being a, an excellent way of making some money and he thought he could actually compete with a, a radio-based telegraph system. And um, the problem was that, of course, to build, a, to, write, to generate a cable, put a cable in across the Atlantic was very expensive, but um, it was much, much cheaper to build a radio system. So he thought he, he really had a winner. And he, ha he actually floated the entire company um, on building this station to prove that you could send signals across the Atlantic. Um, in those days, the, the physics of radio were fairly well understood. And uh, all the academics said, yeah, it's fine, but you, radio is like light waves, and it only goes in a straight line. You're wasting your time trying to send it over the horizon. Uh, but Marconi had faith in it. He, he, he was convinced you could send the radio over any distance. And he and used quite a long wavelength, didn't he? He yeah, was around about the 300 metres. Like I think the middle of medium wave. Yeah. Yes, um, which at the time was um, really the, the only wavelengths and frequencies which were properly understood. Um, and the, everybody thought that the longer the wavelength, the longer the uh, signals would propagate. Um, which wasn't really true. It was true to, to some extent, but of course it was after that that um, people started going, so again, longer waves, they went to short waves, and of course short waves, as we all know, are much more effective at uh, long distance communication. But um, he had a transmitter here which generated about a 15 kilowatt uh, spark signal. It was a huge generator used, 20,000 volts and a, and a couple of um, uh, resonators which uh, sparked and he had a very primitive uh, tuning arrangement to tune it to about one megahertz, 300 meters. And um, after a, 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 a few trials of aerials being blown down and that sort of thing, he did manage to pass his uh, letter S across the, uh, across the Atlantic. And of course, the antenna he used was absolutely huge. We were talking about this earlier, yes, weren't we? we were. It, it, it's unbelievable, unbelievable size. It was, it was 20 200-foot masts. And we're talking of 1901 here, so they had no modern cranes or anything like that. It was built by shipwrights. 
Um, and there were 20, because obviously that was the only people around that had any experience of building masts. They came from Penzance. And there were 20 of them, 200 foot high, in, in a circle 200 feet in diameter. And uh, because of the way that they, they used the radio waves, radio systems in those days, they had no they had no feeders, no coaxial cable or anything like that we would use these days. And um, so the transmitter was right in the middle of this this circle. And uh, the, one of the problems in this area is that we get all the Atlantic gales. I mean, from here, if I look out the window, there's nothing between here and North America. And we do get very, very strong gales. And the inevitable thing happened just before he was due to do the tests. The whole lot blew down. Um, but I don't know how they did it, but they managed to rebuild the aerials in seven days. Um, but, um, but in fact, he had the same problem on the other side of the Atlantic, in the well, well field in uh, and, and Cape Cod near near Boston, uh, with the receiving station. Their aerials blew down, but um, he took advantage of that and moved the receiving station to Glace Bay in uh, Nova Scotia, which is marginally closer. And he used uh, kites. He had one above us uh, to sort the 500 feet of wire for the aerial. So it was all very marginal. It was all very very hairy the way he did it but he, he succeeded and um, as a result he managed to finance the company and uh, move ahead from there building um, a permanent station in uh, 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 Clifton in, in Ireland whereas this station here in Polview is a little bit small and it carried on doing experimental work including some very classic work in the in the 20s uh, using directional shortwave aerials because obviously by that time they were realising that these long wavelengths weren't ideal, and you were better off uh, using the short waves, which, cause, which are actually pioneered by, by amateurs. Um, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, you were saying that they uh, initially gave all the low frequencies yeah. off to the amateurs, and then they discovered that amateurs were making contacts around the world yeah, in, in, very I think modest 1922 power. there was a world radio contest, which I think was in Copenhagen, but I may be wrong on that. And uh, they were allocating frequencies um, for all worldwide services. And the commercial people still believed that the longer wavelengths were the best for long distances. Um, and um, so therefore there was a big scrabble for everything longer than a few hundred metres. Um, and um, so that happened. Um, but the amateurs obviously put a, a bid in at that time. There was a lot of amateur radio going on. <clears throat> and the... Um, conference decided that, well, we'll get rid of the amateurs. We'll, we'll, they will say they can have anything um, below 200 metres, i.e. shorter than 200 metres, 200 metres being, being top band. Um, and um, so they went away, started building transmitters for, uh, for uh, the short, shorter wave bands, so 20 metres and that sort of thing. And um, the commercial people suddenly realised that amateurs with little 10 watt transmitters in their bedrooms with bits of wire out the window were, were working the world, whereas they had to build these huge installations on the low frequencies. So a lot of work then switched to short waves, including, including Marconi from this site here, and developed um, beam-based radio systems um, in the in the what we now call the HF bands, the shortwave bands, and of course that's it's now all history. Nobody uses long waves for other than a limited amount of broadcasting and special systems for communicating with submarines and so on. So the, all the all the long wave transmitters are, are now dead, and uh, to, obviously to a large extent the shortwave transmitters are as well because they will move the satellite services. But but for general long distance communication, you can't beat the HF bands. There you go. That's a little bit about the history of the place. And uh, thank you very much to Terry for that information. Okay. And uh, we've got one or two demonstrations over there. So we're just going to swing the camera around and uh, we'll show you a couple of demonstrations. And this location is absolutely brilliant for getting out across the States. We've got salt water just over there and uh, they've got quite a nice uh, beam up here as well. So uh, I spent the afternoon uh, work in the States, working across to Canada. So had a lot of fun here, but let's spin the camera around and uh, do a couple of demonstrations. I'm very lucky. I've been invited down here to the Marconi Center. I'm joined by Tim here who- uh, Sorry. Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs>